Hello and welcome to Point of View. This week we're taking a look at the controversial practice of land farming and in particular a report conducted by independent soil scientist Dr Doug Edmeads. Land farming is the practice of disposing waste from oil drilling onto marginal or less productive land like sandy areas with contours or dunes. There are currently 12 land farms in Taranaki, the majority of them being down here in southern Taranaki on coastal land. Three of these farms have been con converted sorry, into dairy farms once the waste has finished being spread on the land and then fertilisers used to grow pasture. Dr Edmeads was contracted by the Taranaki Regional Council to look at whether there were any contaminants left over once the land farms had been converted to dairy pasture. His report, which asked if they were fit for purpose as dairy farms, found not only that there were no contaminants left over, but that the land increased in value tenfold. He found the value went from $3,000 to $5,000 per hectare to $30,000 to $40,000 per hectare. The report, however, has been met with criticism from the Green Party, who say the terms of reference are a joke and the science lacks credibility. On tonight's show I'll be talking to Green Party MP Gareth Hughes and I'll be putting his criticisms to the author of the report, Dr Doug Edmeads. Mr Hughes, thank you for joining us. Thank you. You haven't reacted very well to this report, can you tell us why? Well I think Taranaki Regional Council uh, should be questioned over this report. The terms of reference are a joke. This report doesn't stand up to basic scrutiny. I think it's an incredible waste of ratepayers' money in producing this report. So let's go through these points one by one. The first point you make is that the terms of reference are a joke. Why are they a joke? Well, they're a joke because they strictly limit the report to only looking at the on-farm effects. You can't look at the off-site effects, for example, leaching, running off into waterways. The central premise of the terms of reference is, are they fit for purpose? That's incredibly meaningless. Uh, it's not defined anywhere in Ed Meads' report what fit for purpose actually means. Uh, Taranaki Regional Council should be conducting uh, further reports into, is this safe and should this be occurring? Not the meaningless question, are they fit for purpose? Okay, the second thing you say is that the levels weren't tested off-site, but if the levels were below what they should be according to their resource consents on-site, why do you need to test them off-site? Well, what Ed Means' own report finds is that hydrocarbon limits were exceeded. What we know from Taranaki Regional Council monitoring reports is consents have been breached, hydrocarbon and barium levels have been exceeded. Now, the and basic... One on one site? Across numerous TRC reports, there have been questions raised around land farms, but the fact is, in this report, he looks at only three of the dozen land farms, only tests at four sites, only eight soil samples. If we use Canadian guidelines for soil sampling in this area, we should have a thousand samples across a single 30 hectare land farm. I think it is uh, shows the, the poor judgement in the terms of reference, but this report doesn't stand up to basic scrutiny. You cannot conclude land farming is safe. And what we've seen is Fonterra refuse to pick up dairy products from new land farms. I, I don't think Taranaki Regional Council should be producing reports of such poor quality that doesn't stand up to basic scrutiny. And I think questions have to be asked, is Taranaki Regional Council doing its job which it should be as an independent regulator keeping farms, consumers, the community safe because in more and more Taranaki Regional Council is looking like an activist uh, for the oil industry. You say you can't reach the conclusion that all land farms are safe to farm on based on three land farms but according to the report there are only three completed land farms that Dr Edmeads could have tested. My advice is there is a dozen land farms in the Taranaki region. Now, if you were testing parachutes and only tested three parachutes, you wouldn't conclude that all parachutes are safe. Now, the fact is the terms of reference have been set up to limit this report. We've seen hydrocarbon limits being exceeded, and I think we should be actually asking the question, do consumers, both in New Zealand and around the world, want to be buying New Zealand dairy products from farms where toxic byproducts of the oil and gas industry are spread on? And I think if consumers uh, were asked that question directly, the answer would be a resounding no. 
Okay, but with that parachute analogy, can't you say that if every parachute was made this way, it would be safe to jump with? Therefore, if every land farm meets its resource consents the way that these land farms have, then every land farm would be safe to farm on once it's finished. Yes, but we have one of these land farms, is, for example, 30 hectares in size. We saw across the three land farms tested, uh, only eight soil samples. If Canadian guidelines were used, there should be 10 soil samples per quarter hectare. Now, there w should have been a lot more soil samples taken. I don't think this would stand up to scrutiny. I doubt you'd see a reputable peer-reviewed scientific journal publish this report. It's a waste of taxpayers' money, and Taranaki Regional Council should be standing up for the farms, standing up for their community, conducting better scientific research with greater scientific rigour that uses more input data and actually asks a few more questions than this meaningless question they ask because this is a big issue for the region. The spreading of oil and gas byproducts onto dairy farms uh, has, has raised uh, media scrutiny. People, our consumers are asking questions about it and what we need to see the council do is stand up, do their job, be a regulator, not just an advocate and an activist as they're increasingly being perceived by the public in terms of the oil and gas sector. The other thing you've said is you have concerns around the conditions of these resource consents. Can you elaborate on that? Well, I think one of the big unanswered questions for the land farming issue is the fact that the consent conditions and hydrocarbon and other um, limits only apply to when the consent is surrendered. What you could see, and I believe we are seeing in Taranaki, is cows on dairy farms, on land farms, but the hydrocarbon limits are only applied when the consent is surrendered. Now what we see is Fonterra now not taking any dairy products from new land farms because the testing of the milk is prohibitively expensive. They send it across to Australia to test it. So the fact is that the hydrocarbon limits could be incredibly high even when dairy cattle are on those land farms. We've seen in Taranaki Regional Council reports, in fact, oil on top of pasture. And I think the critical question around the safety of the milk, also along with the brand questions uh, and the image questions, is that the way the Taranaki Regional Council are managing these land farms, I think questions still remain on the safety. So you say there's a possibility that cows are grazing on farms with hydrocarbon levels higher than they're meant to be? There is a possibility that dairy cattle are on farms and milk is being taken from land farms where the hydrocarbon limits are exceeding what would be measured at the end of the surrender period. The fact is that these land farms, uh, the whole point of it, uh, the bioremediation is for the hydrocarbon and other uh, nasties as Ed Meads calls them, is to break down in the soil. The critical question for a dairy company like Fonterra or a dairy farmer is having cows on potentially contaminated soil. Now that's why I'm calling on Taranaki Regional Council to do more robust science, do more soil samples, and also why I think Fonterra needs to be a bit more transparent with the results of their testing regime. I'm not saying that milk is unsafe. I'm not saying that oil levels have exceeded uh, safe guidelines from land farms where milk is being taken, but the fact is that data isn't out there, and I think that is a very important question the country needs to answer. What would your response be to a farmer that would say the Green Party would come out against any report that condones land farming, no matter how much science or credibility uh, the report had? We do have big concerns around the practice of spreading oil and gas waste on farms. I think what we're doing is actually standing up for our agricultural sector. Consumers in, say, the UK, who are sold a vision of New Zealand you know, grass-fed agriculture um, that does have sustainability targets. Uh, this is how we sell our dairy products around the world. If those consumers were made aware that we're spreading fracking and other oil and gas waste like drilling mud uh, onto our dairy farms, I think uh, consumers w would question buying New Zealand dairy products. So I think we're looking out for New Zealand's farmers. And basically this report is done uh, doesn't stand up to scrutiny. We are look at the science. We are an evidence-based party, and we are requesting that taxpayers' money should be spent on 
better science and this wouldn't be published in a reputable peer-reviewed journal. So I think that's what farmers should be demanding. So if further reports come out that say land farms are safe to farm on once they're finished, will you reconsider your position? Well I understand Landcare is doing a, a, a very long term study on it at the moment. We will always look and listen to the science. If science was conducted with rigour, was actually challenged through a peer reviewed process, that we were comfortable with the science and showed this was safe, we would always say that we shouldn't be going down the fossil fuel path anyway. But our concern is for consumers and for farmers and the safety of our dairy products. I think this is always going to be a bad look for New Zealand's dairy industry anyway when it's questioned around the world and I don't think we should be doing it. Mr Hughes, thank you for your time. Coming up after the break, we'll be talking to the author of the report, Dr Doug Edmonds. Hello and welcome back to Point of View. Joining me now is author of the report, Dr Doug Edmeads. Dr Edmeads, Gareth Hughes says your report doesn't stand up to basic scrutiny and he doubts a reputable peer-reviewed journal would publish the report. Those are pretty scathing things to say. Is there any merit in those claims? Not, not in my view. Uh, the report wasn't written for a scientific journal who had special standards. The test in this case is not whether a scientific journal would accept it uh, under their conditions, but whether another, sci another scientist, having read the same evidence, would come to the same conclusion. That's the test, and, and, I, and I hope the report is scrutinised by other uh, uh, independent scientists. The fact that it wasn't intended for a scientific journal, though, does that not make it less credible? No, not at all. Not at all. The same scientific standards uh, apply in terms of analysis of the data and do the facts, they do the conclusions, uh, are they consistent with the facts? That all applies. It's just not a, it, the report is not a, a report for a scientific journal. It's for the Taranaki Regional Council. He says the terms of reference of the report are a joke because they strictly limit the report to only looking at the on-site effects and not the off-site effects such as leaching or getting into waterways. What's your response to that? Well, my response, I, I don't quite understand the question, frankly, because if, if there are no on-site effects, and that's what my report says, there are no on-site effects, how can there be off-site effects? In addition to that, so I don't quite understand the question, but in addition to that, um, we know that the contaminants that come with this, the potential contaminants, like uh, heavy metals or, or um, barium, etc., etc., don't move in the soil. So they don't leach and don't run off. Um, uh, so I, I don't ag agree with him at all. Yes, but as he points out, your own report show that hydrocarbon levels were exceeded and resource consent conditions were breached. <laughs> You've got to put that in context. On one site and one particular um, uh, petrochemical hydrocarbon exceeded the levels during the process in which the land farming was done. But when I came back two years after it was completed, and measured those so same things. They were below the level of detection. And that's uh, appropriate. That's how these uh, procedures uh, 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 carry on. I see. So the levels are below what they should be once a land farm has actually been completed. Yes, yes. OK, Mr Hughes says the central premise of the terms of reference is, are they fit for purpose? He says it, this is a meaningless question and you don't clarify what it means. Uh, what's your response to that? Well, I disagree with them again, and let me be very clear about this. Um, there were no, I wasn't given any prescribed terms of reference. Uh, I looked at the situation uh, and decided that what was required here was, to use my words, are these reform soils fit for the purpose, in this case, of dairy farming? And so that was the condition that I applied to my report. Um, Fit for purpose is, is very specific. Uh, are there any heavy metals left over in the soils or in the pastures? No. Are there any petrochemical residues in the soil of the plants? No. Is barium a problem? No. Uh, uh, um, uh, have the soils been uh, made more saline, too much salt? Answer, no. They, uh, so th these soils are typically like so many other soils in New Zealand and they're fit for purpose. OK, let's go back to the testing methods. Uh, Mr Hughes says, you only tested at three land farms, at four sites, and with eight soil samples. 
Uh, he says that if you go by Canadian standards, you would have taken a thousand samples from one 30 hectare land farm, therefore the standards aren't high enough. Uh, do you think he's got a point there? Well, I don't, I don't know whether there would be thousands, and, <laughs> as he says. Um, let me explain. This is a consented uh, process. There are 27 special conditions which have to be met during the process of putting out uh, this material and mixing it into the, into the soil. Uh, and that, that requires that regular soil samples are taken throughout the process. So in the one case of, of the, uh, one of the land farms, there were something like 50 samples collected during the process of um, putting out this material. Uh, as required by the resource consent. So this is not an open slather, just go out there and biff it on the soil and who cares. This is a very, very carefully prescribed uh, consented process. Uh, so I knew all that data was, was being collected, I reviewed all that data, that's in the report. In addition to that, I've gone back and taken my own samples to make sure that what, was hap what, uh, what happened uh, during the process of, of land farming is now uh, safe for fit for purpose. But is testing on three land farms at four sites with eight soil samples enough to say that these land farms are fit for purpose? Well, <laughs> let's break down the question. Um, there are only three sites that have been completed um, and, and are currently being used for farming. And that was the question I had. Are these soils fit for the purpose of farming? So there's only three sites available. Within that, there was one site which had irrigated and non-irrigated. So, in fact, I sampled that too. So we had, in addition, uh, so we had in total four different sites, uh, and 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 one under uh, some under irrigation, some not. The fact that all the four sites, and, and when, when I went and sampled, I didn't just take one sample of one area. Uh, you take random samples across the whole area, representative of the whole area. Uh, and the fact that all four sites, irrespective of how they've been managed up, up till now, give similar results, i.e. there's not a problem, um, you don't need um, to go any, any further. Bear in mind also that I had, when I did the report, all of the uh, intensive sampling results from each site during the process at, in which they um, put out the, the drilling waste. So all that information is in my report. Well, Mr Hughes says that if you were to test three parachutes, you couldn't say that all parachutes are safe. Uh, same thing with these land farms. If you test three, you can't say all land farms are safe. My response to that is um, there's three completed land farms. Uh, could I say with any uh, confidence that therefore other land farms will be the same in terms of there are no problems? I would respond to that by saying, if, and, and I've already made the point, this whole process is heavily um, uh, consented in terms of the conditions that must apply, in terms of the levels of hydrocarbons, levels of heavy metals, uh, levels of saline uh, uh, salts, etc., etc. Very, very heavily um, conditioned, the, these consents. Now, I would expect that if another land farm was done under the same conditions of the consent, then you get the same outcome. Mr Hughes says he has concerns around the resource consent conditions. He says that the conditions don't apply until the consent has been surrendered. So we could be seeing cows grazing on uh, land farms in Taranaki where the levels are higher than they should be. It's just that the consents haven't been surrendered yet. Does he have a valid point there, do you think? Once again, I don't think he understands the process uh, that is required for these consents. As the various pieces of, of the land farms are, are, are topped up or the materials are added, samples are taken during that whole process. And those samples have to meet certain specifications with, with, with respect to um, petrochemical hydrocarbons. Uh, so th and those conditions are set down by the Ministry for the Environment. So I looked at all that data uh, during, that accumulated during the process of forming the land farms and then I went back there several years after they had been completed and took further samples and there are no problems there in terms of residues. So I, I, I just simply don't understand this question, it, it's no longer valid. Can I just get your reaction to this and I know you can't answer on behalf of the Taranaki Regional Council and this doesn't specifically concern your report 
But Dr Hughes says the Taranaki Regional Council is looking more and more like an activist for the oil industry. Well, how, how can I possibly comment on that? I don't know what the relationship is between the Regional Council and, and the petrochemical industry. I've got no idea. As all I can say is that this is a, a heavily consented process. There are 26 special conditions apply, uh, all, and con the conditions all laid down by the Ministry of Environment and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, to comply with the process uh, during the land farming. And I come along after that process and have a look. There's no, no apparent problems in terms of the major contaminants that we would expect to find there. So a pretty adamant Dr Edmeads there. The question is though, who's right? Is Dr Edmeads' report credible? Well we at Country TV believe the true test is whether other scientists back Dr Edmeads' testing methods terms of reference and his findings. So we sent the report to three scientists. We let Dr Ed Meads and the Green Party recommend one each and chose one of our own. Dr Ed Meads recommended Craig Ross, a senior soil scientist at Landcare Research and probably the most qualified to comment on this report. In short, Dr Ross backed the report. He disagreed the terms of reference are a joke and said the sampling size quoted by the Green Party of 1,000 samples is ridiculous for this kind of test and the sample size Dr Edmeads took was adequate. His one criticism is Dr Edmeads only tested to a depth of 7.5 centimetres but the drilling waste was incorporated into a minimum depth of 25 centimetres so you can't categorically state there are no contaminants left over deeper. However it is noted in the report that the waste was spread evenly. He made the point that it could be misinterpreted that it's the nutrients in the drilling wastes that increases the value of, these, of the land and the land farms, but it's actually just the fact that the waste fills in holes and recontours the land to make it flat, which allows you to farm on it. However, Dr Ed Meads has always been open and consistent about this when interviewed. The scientist we chose to consult was Professor of Agribusiness at Waikato University, Jacqueline Roweth. Ms Roweth also backed up Dr Edmead's report and said that if the waste had been spread evenly as claimed, the sampling would not be expected to have much variability and so the numbers of samples would not need to be very large. She said the fact that the data didn't change much between samplings suggested that variability is not high. And she said his findings that the exceeding levels will reduce over time is correct. Therefore those high levels on that one farm will decrease over time and be within limits. Moving on finally to the Green Party's recommendation, Dr Mike Joy. Dr Joy told us he was not qualified to comment on the report and referred us to his colleague Dr Nick Kim. Dr Kim said on first review and within the context of the report's objectives, he saw nothing that caused him to question Dr Edmead's conclusions. He said as might be expected from land farming, some of the hydrocarbons are detected but these will continue to degrade and the reported concentrations are not very high. So there you have it, three out of three scientists back Dr Edmeads in his report. Thank you to my guests Dr Doug Edmeads, Gareth Hughes and to the scientists who spared their time to review the report. And thank you for watching. Music